Chapter 2 of Napoleon, A Short Biography This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeffrey Wilson, Ames, Iowa. Napoleon, A Short Biography by R. M. Johnston. Chapter 2. Toulon and Vendémiaire. Bonaparte and Corsica. Siege of Toulon. The Terror. Vendémiaire. Marriage of Napoleon and Josephine Beauharnais. Army of Italy. Tactics and Strategy in 1796. From 1789 until 1793, during, that is, the first four years of the Revolution, Bonaparte was striving to improve his prospects in connection with Corsican affairs. He paid several visits to the island, joined the French Democratic Party, but could not succeed either in securing the victory of that party at Ajaccio or in bringing to a favorable end a small military expedition he led into Sardinia. In the course of these intrigues and proceedings we catch an interesting glimpse of him noted by his school friend Bourrienne during a short stay in Paris. The young Corsican officer, whose watch was in pawn and whose dinners were generally provided by his friends, saw among other sights the march of a mob of five hundred men to the Tuileries, and Louis the Sixteenth complying with their orders by appearing at a window wearing a red Phrygian cap. Bonaparte was deeply moved at this spectacle, and declared with indignation that with a couple of guns he could have dispersed all the scum of the faubourgs and taught them a lesson they would never have forgotten. The doings of Bonaparte at this period have no large bearing on history and are in part somewhat obscure, but after the final failure of the French party in Corsica he returned to his occupation as an officer of artillery serving now in the rank of captain, 1793. In August of the same year, the French Republic, assailed on every side, received a severe blow by the inhabitants of Toulon proclaiming the king and calling to their help an Anglo-Spanish fleet. The government immediately sent troops to attempt the recapture of the fortress, and Bonaparte found himself in command of the small force of artillery collected. His skill and judgment quickly won recognition, and he was soon promoted to the functions of a lieutenant colonel. His energy made feasible the only plan that promised success. It consisted in capturing one of the English positions, the Fort de Leguillette, whence the bay and shipping could be commanded. Bonaparte pressed forward the work, but the British fire was severe and the guns of his battery were silenced. He then had recourse to his knowledge of human nature and of the French soldier. A large sign was posted, This is the battery of the men without fear, and a call was made for volunteers. This was well responded to. Some severe fighting ensued. Finally, the British position was breached and stormed. As Bonaparte had foreseen, this success of the French entailed the immediate evacuation of Toulon by the Anglo-Spanish forces. Thus Bonaparte won his first reputation, and before many months passed, his services were recognized by promotion to the rank of Brigadier General. It was at the period we have now reached that the revolution attained its extreme of violence. The government of France had been seized by the Jacobin Club and Robespierre. An enthusiastic conformity to their doctrines appeared the only means of escaping the guillotine. Bonaparte, like nearly every other officer of the French army, made show of zeal in support of the terrorists, and was during some months on close terms with Robespierre Jeune. But in Thermidor, July of 1794, the Jacobin tyranny was broken, and in the reaction that followed, Bonaparte was for a few weeks placed under arrest. After his release, having thrown up his command in the southern army, 
he went to Paris where he probably hoped to find some opportunity of advancement in the turmoil of politics. That opportunity was slow in coming, but he refused the command of a brigade of infantry in the Army of the West rather than leave the capital. At last, in the autumn of 1795, events took place that marked his first step forward in the political world. Since the fall of Robespierre in 1794, a strong movement of reaction had taken place in the capital, partly royalist, wholly conservative. Most of the sections of Paris were hostile to the convention, which aimed at retaining power under a newly framed constitution, and as each section had its battalion of national guards, the movement soon took an insurrectional and menacing aspect. The executive power of the Republic was to be vested in a committee of five, the Directoire, among the members of which was Barras, who, as a representative of the government, had known Bonaparte at Toulon and had been struck by his talents. In the last days of September 1795, the movement of the sections became more pronounced, the symptoms of an approaching storm more clear, and the convention charged Barras with its defense and with the command of all the troops in Paris. But Barras was a civilian and needed military assistance. He therefore called to his aid several generals then in the capital. Among them was Bonaparte, who accepted, though not without hesitation, his personality, his decision and promptitude completely turned the scale. At this point we may pause for one moment to recall an anecdote of those days that is eminently characteristic of the man. Thiebaud, a young officer, reported at headquarters and found the newly appointed general seated at a table in conversation. He appeared small, of poor physique, with long lanky hair and a shabby uniform. He was asking questions of the most elementary character of officers of far greater experience and seniority in military administration. There was an inclination among some of those present to smile at the ignorance displayed by the newcomer, but Thiebault admired his complete absence of false pride, the searching character of his inquiries, and the rapidity with which he appeared to assimilate the information he acquired. The officers placed under his command were certainly not inclined to think lightly of him for long. On the 13th of Vendemiaire, the revolt came to a head, and the sections prepared to march against the assembly. Bonaparte seized all the available artillery, owing to the promptitude of a major of cavalry, Murat by name. The few thousand troops available were concentrated about the Tuileries, and as soon as the National Guards began their movement, Bonaparte opened with grape along the streets leading to his central position. There was considerable bloodshed, but the insurrection collapsed immediately, as must all insurrections treated in that prompt and uncompromising way. Bonaparte's second successful demonstration of his knowledge of the theory and practice of artillery received large recognition for he was shortly afterwards appointed to the command of the Army of the Interior. He was now a rising man in the state, and for this reason succeeded in winning the hand of a lady of rank and beauty to whom he had been paying his attentions for some months. Josephine Tacher de la Pagerie was a beautiful Creole who had married the Vicomte de Beauharnais, an officer in the French service by whom she had two children, Eugène and Hortense. Beauharnais fought for the Republic, was unsuccessful, and went to the guillotine one of the last victims of the Reign of Terror. His widow became one of the beauties of the new fashionable society that centered about the dissipated Barras and his wife. Whether she loved Bonaparte is very doubtful, but it is clear that she felt his magnetic power, 
and when it was decided that he was to have the command of one of the armies on the frontier, she married him. The marriage took place on the 11th of March, 1796, and on the 21st Bonaparte started for Nice to assume command of the Army of Italy. It appears not improbable that Josephine's influence with the Barras had been largely instrumental in securing this important appointment. We now have come to the beginning of Napoleon's career as a commander-in-chief, and since his history must be essentially military, since he remains without question the greatest soldier concerning whom we have accurate information, it will be well to examine at this point, before we follow him into Italy, what was actually represented by a movement of troops or a battle in his time. To speak of an advance or retreat of a right or left wing, or of a movement resulting in so many thousands being killed, wounded, or taken prisoners, conveys but the vaguest notion of the evolutions actually carried out. When considering the history of the greatest of captains, it will not be out of place to take a preliminary view of the tactics and strategy of his day, and to attempt to convey some more precise impression of the actual occurrences of the battlefield. When the French Revolution broke out, the art of war was as much trammeled by narrow regulations as was that of letters. The methods and traditions were those of Frederick the Great, but dogmatism had supplanted genius. Rigidity of discipline and tactical formalism were the foundation of the system. The soldier was a brutalized individual, skilled in multitudinous attitudes and formations, fighting like a machine under the inspiration of constant floggings. Two opposing lines of infantry, each formed on a depth of two or three ranks, would advance nearer and nearer to each other in the most perfect alignment, every musket even, every toe turned to the same angle. When within firing distance, the one whose discipline was the more rigid would generally manage to survive the two or three mechanical volleys that would be exchanged at a range of fifty to one hundred and twenty yards. With regiments thus drilled, the great aim of every commander was to attain tactical perfection, and the conduct of a battlefield became slow and artificial. War was turned into a scientific game with arbitrary rules. France revolutionized war as she had every political and social observance. With promotion thrown open to every soldier, with the doctrine of liberty, equality, fraternity proclaimed, with many of the old officers leaving the country, it became impossible to maintain discipline, and in many of the early battles of the Republic, the French army suffered in consequence. The convention declared that corporal punishment should not be inflicted on free men. The sentiment was to its honor, but the army was soon reduced to chaotic conditions. From these conditions arose a new army, bolder and greater than the old. It was inspired by ardent patriotism, that finest of all the military virtues, and made up in dash, intelligence, and courage what it lacked in science. From these circumstances a new system of tactics was evolved, of which the most characteristic innovation may be understood by the following convenient illustration. A body of men marching along a road will naturally form a column, say four abreast. Suppose such a column arrives near a village occupied by the enemy and attempts to take it. What is the simplest, least scientific manner in which this might be accomplished? In the first place, the most raw of officers and inexperienced of troops would quickly learn to double up so as to convert a front of four into a front of eight. Then a quick dash, the bayonet, the pressure of the rear ranks on the first would do the rest. This was, in its roughest form, the usual French system of attack during the wars of the Republic and Empire. 
the same column deployed or opened up right and left, would give an extended front for firing when on the defensive. When attacking, the distance the column would have to cover exposed to musketry fire will be realized when it is stated that the extreme range of the musket then in use was 200 yards. Effective volleys were generally fired at from 120 down to 60 yards. When a French brigade attacked, the usual disposition was for about one quarter of the infantry to be dispersed as skirmishers to draw and divert the enemy's fire. Behind these skirmishers, columns would be formed, brought up as far forward as the ground would permit, and at the proper moment launched at the enemy's line at the charge. The formation of these columns varied according to circumstances, but a front of sixteen and depth of seventy men, equivalent to two battalions of reduced strength, may be taken as representing a rough average. The French infantry excelled in offensive evolutions, in quickly seizing a hill house or hedge, and their celerity of movement and intelligence proved more than a match for the methods of the armies opposed to them. Before many years had passed, every country of Europe, save Great Britain alone, abandoned the old tactics and copied the new. Similar changes took place in the handling of artillery and especially of cavalry, which were now used with far greater boldness, especially for completing the destruction of the enemy after a successful engagement. Perfect alignment became a secondary consideration. Strategy changed on the same lines as tactics. Slow, methodical movements were checked by rapid marching. The capture of a fortress became an object of less importance than the destruction of an army. Bonaparte fought his first campaign when the new theories of war were just beginning to emerge from chaos, when a number of self-made and excellent officers had won their way to the heads of regiments and brigades. He grasped with a firm hand the instrument fate had placed in his hands and wielded it from the very first instant with the skill of a master. End of chapter 2 Recording by Geoffrey Wilson, Ames, Iowa